not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive his, his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He disregarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weaknesses were turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated, The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what has been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with with us they would be made perfect. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start a new sermon series today on Hebrews chapter 11, entitled, By Faith. 
You know, you read through this, this chapter, and I could walk off the stage, and we could, get, we could get enough out of it today, couldn't we? It's an inspiring chapter with some amazing heroes of the faith and some amazing stories, and I look forward to digging into that together as we go through this tra- great chapter over the next few months. I think we can't talk enough about our faith. It's not a topic we can ever exhaust in any way, and I think it's easy as Christians and as the church to, to assume that we have the kind of faith this chapter is talking about, and I think it's even easier to forget and lose track of this kind of faith that this passage is talking about. Uh, you know, it reminds me of what happened yesterday in my family. Uh, Mandy's uh, mother and father are here, Mike and Tess Fontenot from uh, Australia. Well, I want to welcome them all the way from Sydney, Australia. You might remember Mike. Mike was that tall, dark, young, handsome young man who preached uh, the Ethiopian eunuch a while back to us. You might remember Mike here in the spring preaching. That was an awesome sermon. People still talk about it. But anyway, we were up there with Mandy's uh, sister and brother-in-law and their kids uh, at the Scottsdale Farmer's Market yesterday. Anybody been to the Farmer's Market? It's really, really nice. Check it out. Saturday morning. And, uh, you know, we got a ton of kids. We were kind of in two groups. And at the end, we call, kind of all met up at this shop. And uh, Violet, my third-born daughter, uh, she, she needed to use the restroom before we got on the road. And she told me she was going to, you know, I said, oh, I think we have just enough time. We were sitting there waiting for some other people to get back from shopping. And time passes. We're all talking. You know, we get in the, the two cars, you know, and we go. And I'm just driving along, and I get, this, I get this phone call, and it's a local number, and I'm thinking, oh, it's probably a telemarker, so I decline it. Then it calls again, and I almost didn't answer, but I thought, that's kind of weird. Maybe it's not a telemarker. Maybe I should pick it up. So I answer the phone while I'm driving, which I don't recommend, but sometimes you got to do that. Not endorsing that. And uh, it, it was touch-free, right? It was touch-free. I think that's the law. And, uh, and, and, and I, you know, hello? Dad, it's Violet. You left me. And then it just dawned on me. You know, I knew Violet went to the, the restroom, but, but so much time had passed, I assumed, you know, she, she had come back, but then honestly, more than assumed, I just forgot that she went to the restroom. And, and so it, it was a really humbling moment, and, and at first I was like, oh, we, we were testing you, and I, you know, and I realized that, was, that I couldn't lie to her. So, so, you know, we turned around and went back and got her, uh, and, uh, and I apologized to her profusely. Mike was my witness. I did apologize profusely. And, and, and one more time publicly, I want to apologize, Bob, for forgetting you at the uh, Scottsdale Farmer's Market. But I told her, I said, hey, we have church on Sunday, so you just could have hung out and then found us, you know, at 4 o'clock today. But, you know, it worked out where I came back and got her. I'm so sorry, Violet. Uh, you're awesome. Thank you for forgiving me. Maybe she's, she's still working on it. Amen. But I, but, but I, I think sometimes we, we need that call from God with our faith. Hey, do you remember me? Because we put our faith in so many things as Christians that have nothing to do with faith. Like the church. We put our faith in the church. The Bible never teaches us to put our faith in the church. We're to be a part of the church. We're to represent Christ as the church. But we don't put our faith in the church. We don't put our faith in our feelings. Oh, heaven forbid we put our faith in our feelings. you, You don't need to be putting your faith in me. Our faith needs to be in God and God alone. And so hopefully as we study through Hebrews 11, we can be reminded by God. He can call us several times until we get it of what it really means to live by faith. These are going to be some great stories that we're going to really learn a lot from. But today what I want to do to start out is really just attempt attempt to define faith. It's not not really that easy. Uh, A lot of scholars think it's hard to define faith. It's easier to describe faith. And Hebrews 11 describes faith you know, what faith is like. And how do you know when you really have, you know, biblical faith? Well, it's kind of like, how do you know when you're in love? You know, my, my daughters asked me, how did you know, Dad, you know, when you were in love with Mom? And I was like, I can't tell you when, but I knew, I knew when I was. I knew what I was feeling at that point. And I think biblical faith is like that. You know when you truly experience it. And there are a lot of answers, pictures of faith in this chapter we're going to be studying out. But, of course, uh, the chapter starts out in Hebrews 11, verse 1, the first thing that we read, saying that, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Uh, The Greek words here for confidence and assurance that the NIV translates, uh, they're they're, they're very rich Greek words and they're very pregnant with meaning, like Capri. They're very pregnant with meaning. And I pray for the the baby to come soon. Amen. And uh, these words are very rich. Uh, And if you go into other translations um, in the the different English versions of, of the Greek, we already have the NIV, the, the words are, it's confidence and assurance, right? Confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The ESV 
It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So they translate the Greek words a little different there. The CEV, totally different. Faith makes us sure of what we hope for. I think the old NIV would say that. And gives us proof of what we cannot see. And then the KJV, it's actually my favorite one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So we can learn here uh, that faith is about really two things uh, based on uh, this definition. Number one, it's, it's based on our thinking, right? Our thinking. It uses the words confidence, assurance, conviction. You know, that, that, that's, that's how we think, right? How we think about things. But the other part of it, you know, if that's kind of like, you know, the, the, the X in the, in the grid, well, this is kind of the Y, and they kind of intersect in our faith. The other part of it is reality. So it's our thinking combined with reality because it uses words like proof and evidence, and substance. So faith is not just a, a mental state we work toward and try to maintain, although it is obviously a mental activity, but it's a mental experience that produces choices in reality. So to live by faith is, is combining our thinking with reality. You're doing it right now. By faith, you believe this is more important than watching an NFL game right now or or having family dinner, or whatever else, right? Your, 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 your biblical thinking to come to church is now combined with the reality, and you are here listening to me preach. And so it, 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 it's not that hard to define, but it's, it's much easier to describe. A practical illustration of this idea, I think, can help. One night, a house caught fire, and a young boy was forced to flee to the roof. The father stood on the ground, and below, with outstretched arms, called out, Jump, I'll catch you! He knew the boy had to jump to save his life. All the boy could see, however, was flame, smoke, and blackness. As can be imagined, he was afraid to leave the roof, so his father kept yelling, jump, I will catch you. But the boy protested, daddy, I can't see you. The father replied, but I can see you, and that's all that matters. The child will jump, right, in the end, because he knows his father will catch him. His thinking will meet reality only when those two things combine, uh, Donner Atwood, I think, put it very well. He said, the Christian faith enables us to face life or meet death, not because we can see, but with the certainty that we are seen. Not that we know all the answers, but that we are known. And so faith is all about, you know, who are we putting it in? You know, who are we putting faith in is, is really what matters more than anything else. And we often, as I said, you know, mistake, uh, you know, faith for, for other things, Specifically in the church, we can often focus on people, and really that has nothing to do with faith. It has nothing to do with faith. Um, and people will say, well, I, I lack faith, or I'm struggling in my faith, or I don't even have faith because of this person, you know, who treated me this way in the church, or, you know, I had this, you know, I don't have faith anymore that God can use me because I had this great friend and I helped him become a Christian, and, and then they fell away from God, and so I, I, no, I no longer have faith. And I'm, and I'm sorry if that's where you're at today. That's a sad state to live in. To, to be lacking faith in a sense, but that, but that actually wasn't really faith then. If what someone did made you lose your faith, that wasn't actually biblical faith because biblical faith has nothing to do with, 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 with us and, and ourselves, but it has everything to do with our, our thinking vested in reality and, and what that means about our walk with God. That's what, that's what biblical faith is all about. And the Hebrew writer implies that faith is linked strongly to what we truly believe about God. Uh, there in verse 6, we read a little while earlier, right? What does it say there? Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so, you know, that's a great definition too, that biblical faith is you, you believe God exists and you believe God is good. And that's a pretty simple definition, right, uh, in a lot of ways, but not so simple sometimes to believe in our heart of hearts. Living by faith is about a trust, a confidence that God is as real as all that I can see, and that he is as good as all good can be. That, that, that is what it means to, to live by faith. And again, you know, we, we operate in this realm quite a bit, actually. Uh, and it's been interesting. I, we, my family moved to Arizona in, in January of this year, and, uh, and it's amazing how many times I heard over the course of the summer about Halloween. It would always pop up, and I thought it was kind of strange. Like, why are we talking about Halloween in July? But then I came to the grocery store, like, fries, and I, I walk in, and like, it's like, it's like mid-August, and there's like, there's like Halloween stuff everywhere already. And I'm thinking, man, this is a marketing sc scam, you know, for sure. But, 
But then the more I research why, why people in Phoenix love to talk about Halloween, it's not because they, they worship the devil or they love candy or they're really into costumes. That, that I think has, has, has some, some of the excitement with Halloween for the kids more. But why the adults love Halloween in Arizona is because once Halloween comes, the heat is finally oppressively over. It starts to cool off. Did I get that right? Am I right here? Okay. That's good. I, I'm starting to learn how to be an Arizonian. That's good. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But, you know, why do we put the, the, the decorations out in late August, early September? You know, well, it's, it's, it's our belief that, that cooler weather is coming, you know, and connecting with reality, right? It, and, and now, if you did this in July, it'd be kind of stupid because it's still hot. It's still hot. You know, we, but you start doing it in August and September, it's like, oh, yeah, Halloween is on its way. It's just around the corner, you know, faith, faith, faith is not just I believe. I believe because of, uh, of the evidence, because of the nature of God. Just like it's not that odd now that I live in Arizona to see the Halloween stuff in August because we know the cooler weather is just around the corner. And praise God, it's come a little earlier this year. I know I'm thanking God for that. And so that, that's an exercise in, 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 in our belief, can, you know, connecting to reality. And, and that's really what Christianity is meant to be. We have these beliefs about God that we know to be 100% true. And then, we, and then we live that out in reality day in and day out. And that's how you live by faith, if you just want a simple definition of it. Living by faith is living, another way to say it is it's living with reason. What, you know, what I believe meeting my reality. That, we, we reason every day all the time, right? And Christians are meant to, to live out a true and reasonable faith, as Paul called it, called it in Acts 26. And there's actually three examples in the text here of reason. So now you have to think a little bit more. I'm sorry about that. It's cooling off, though, so your brain should be working better. Right, we, we've had some good weather lately, but there's actually three accounts of reason here that I about, and it's all about Abraham and Sarah. Um, are kind of some of the stars in this chapter. Uh, the first one here in verses 11 through 12 on the screen there it says, "By faith even Sarah, come on sisters, who was past childbearing, and, and they think she was around 90 or 91 when she became pregnant with Isaac. She was unable to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, Abraham, it refers to there." And he was probably around 100 when Isaac was born. And as good as dead came, to, you know, came all these descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. That's Hebrews 11, verses 11 through 12. And so Sarah, she struggled, right? What did she do when she heard in the tent? She laughed, right? She struggled, right, to believe. She was cynical at best. But eventually she reasoned, it says here, that God is God. And if he says it will be, then it will be, right? She reasoned in her, in her belief and her reality. She reasoned. You know, living by faith is believing in God's promises no matter what we see, no matter what we're lacking, no matter what obstacle we have to overcome. That's what it means to live by faith. Of course, Abraham is mentioned in the second passage in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. It says there, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And it says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You know, if you know the story really well, and we'll certainly look at this at some point in Genesis, you know, Abraham, you know, he, he figured, hey, if, if God gave me Isaac, which we just read about with the previous uh, section there with, with, with uh, Sarah, if God gave me Isaac and he wants me to sacrifice Isaac, well, then surely he can give me Isaac back. Because he told me that through Isaac, you know, my, my offspring will be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, right? And so, so living by faith believes the impossible is possible. It believes God just, you know, God can perform a miracle to account for another miracle. That's, that's, you know, that's what God can do. And what I love about the Christian faith is it's not just, a, it's not just in our head, though. Because even, even in these accounts, of, they had to reason. Because we can start to get kind of philosophical, you know, like let me... Let me, you know, sit in Starbucks, you know, with my cold nitro brew, and let me reason with God and be intellectual. And, but, but, but even in these reasoning situations, right, you know, Abraham and, and, Abraham and Sarah, they, they, did, they, they couldn't just believe that God would give them a child for the sake of, of a PG rating. Something had to happen, right, between Abraham, you know, Abraham and, I, and, and, and Sarah for a child to come. And I'll leave it at that, right? You understand where I'm going with that. There, there had to be, you know, reason and action working together. Abraham, you know, had to, he had to get the wood for the, for the burnt offering and the, and the rope for the sacrifice, and he had to saddle up his son who he was going to sacrifice, and he had to, he had to act, right, 
on that reason and go up to Mount Moriah and offer his son as a sacrifice, which God, of course, intervened and said he didn't need to do. But again, you know, their, their, their reason and their, and their actions, they worked together. So, so faith is never just a mental exercise. It always combines with something present in reality, these actions. Uh, and then the last passage in verse 8, I think, kind of shows how Abraham and Sarah got this whole thing going. In verse 8, it shows how reason and action combine in faith how all this faith journey started for Abraham and Isaac. It says there, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Like that boy jumping, you know, into the darkness, through the smoke, because he heard his father's voice. You know, faith, that's why faith is so powerful for, for, for the Christian walk. It allows us to grow and go even when we don't know. You know, it, it allows us to grow and go even when we don't know. That's why faith is so powerful powerful. So in the Bible, true faith belief is always accompanied by action. And we know the passage in James 2. James chapter 2, what does it say there about faith? It says, faith without deeds is dead. And there's a whole section about that, you know, that whole point that you, you know, you can't have one without the other. It's, it's two sides of the same coin, right? It's, 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 it's the outside and the inside of my shirt. It's all, it's all my shirt, right? Faith, faith and deeds, they, they, they work together. And there's actually a great picture in the Old Testament, one of the ones I love. There are many, many good references. But in Joshua chapter 3, Joshua has taken over. Moses has died. They've now entered in, you know, they're about to enter into the promised land. They're on the banks of the Jordan River. But, you know, Joshua is not so confident. So over and over, God says, you know, be confident, you know, be strong and courageous, you know, to Joshua. And then God says, hey, I'm going I'm to go ahead of you, though, into the promised land to really give you a confidence boost. And so he tells the priests to pick up the Ark of the God, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, sorry, the Ark of the Covenant, and, and, and it says that, that once they set foot into the Jordan River, the river will back up. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a mini, miniature part of the Red Sea, you know, a little mini, mini Moses there, Joshua's going to get a, a, a little mini miracle, you know, as the priests obey God. And so, and so what happens is the priests, you know, they grab the Ark of the Covenant, they, and, the, and then once they set foot, all of them, into the Jordan River, and it says it's at flood stage, then it says the river's backed up, right? And they cross the, the Jordan River on dry land. If they had no faith, there would be no stepping into the river. And if there was no stepping into the river, there would have been no miracle. Faith and actions always work together. But we know that's a struggle. It's never simple or easy to live by faith day in uh, and day out. And this chapter will really help us. I think this chapter will challenge us a lot as we study into it, but it's also going to help us, I hope, to really make, uh, you know, living by faith a practical and real thing day in and day out as a church. And I'm excited to see what God will do as, as we learn to live more and more by faith as a church body. But again, we got to watch out. You know, we, we often settle for, for blind faith without reason in reality. We, or we even settle, sadly, for a mix of faith and doubt a lot of times. Or, e- or even worse, we just settle for optimism. If I feel good, I'll go. If I don't, I won't. You know, and, and, that, and that's just practical optimism, which isn't far from practical atheism at some point. Uh, if we don't grow in our faith. And so, and so the question today for us, and we're going to take communion here at the end uh, in a moment, uh, you know, by faith, I want you to think about this, by faith, where is God calling you? Where is God calling you? Because we're all at different points in our faith today. Where does reason, trust, assurance in God need to meet reality and you need to act in your life? Where, where is God calling you today? You know, we're really good at inventing new words. I love, I love all the new words that keep getting invented. Uh, Recently, I was at church. It was last Wednesday. We had a great midweek. Dave Blotley preached the word from New Zealand. If you weren't at midweek last Wednesday, you missed it. You missed it. That's why you need to come to midweek. But anyway, we had a great lesson from David Blotley from New Zealand. And, uh, and I was talking to one of the brothers. I said, oh, hey, were you serving in kids' kingdom? He said, yeah, yeah, I got voluntold. I was like, oh, voluntold. Like, like you weren't really asked. You were just kind of told to volunteer. Voluntold, that's a good word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take note of that, you know. And then, and then I've been very guilty of this, sisters. And so please call me out. If I mansplain up here, please call me out. Call me out if I mansplain, because men, we're really good at mansplaining. Uh, but there's a new word I want to introduce to you guys in light of this study series that I want us, every Sunday we're going to have a challenge based on this word. And the challenge is we're, we're going to have faithshin. We're going to go after faithshin as a region. That's your faith combining with action. Faithshin. Are you getting it now? Are you getting it? I know it's some of, some of us, you know, the ASU students, I know you're working hard here. Get it. Get it going there. Get it. Okay, amen. Amen. They're getting it. They're, they're nodding now. They're nodding. When faith and action need to meet, that is faithship. 
We'll see if it sticks. I don't know. I'll copyright it if it sticks. So this week, this week, I want you to take a faith shin challenge. I want you to give yourself a faith shin challenge. For me, I've already decided this is going to be mine, and you can ask me when you see me how it's going. I've been sharing my faith a lot lately, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen as much as I'd like to see from that. And so, so but what I realize is I don't talk about Jesus enough. I'm just kind of talking to people about events. And so what I want to do this week is I want to try to get as many people as I can to open up John 8, 31 to 32 with me. And what I want to say is instead of, hey, do you want to come to something? Or, hey, would you like to come to our church? I want to say, hey, can I share a scripture with you? Whenever I get the opportunity, and I'm going to look at John 8, 31 to 32, where Jesus says, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And just kind of see what Jesus' words might do in helping someone to find true faith. And the reason I want to do that is because I believe with all my heart. That's why I'm an evangelist. I believe with all my heart that God wants all men and women to be saved. I believe that with all my heart, and so that's, that's my belief, but in reality, how do, how, do I, how do I do that? Well, I think I get Jesus out there to people, and I share with them his words and see what he might do, and so for you, it might be something else. Maybe it's not about his truth. Maybe it's about God's grace, that what you believe about God's grace, and where does, where does reality need to meet what you believe about God's grace this week? That might be your faith shit, right? Or maybe it's, it's God's mercy or, or God's love, but just, just try to take something practically, think about it, write it down. Uh, and I'd love to hear uh, w- what happens. And next Sunday, we'll open it up about the faith shins and see uh, what might happen. And if you have a better term, a better word to invent, let me know. I'm totally open. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. It's going to take persistence to grow in our faith. And Abraham and Sarah certainly had their ups and downs, right? We know about that. Uh, Moses certainly had his ups and downs. And, and I do, and I do uh, you know, want to lift up my, my, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, Mike and Tess here. I really respect their faith. They're, I respect them in many ways, but I really respect their faith. 40 years ago, they had little, two little kids, and they decided to leave Louisiana and go, and go try to evangelize a whole continent. The main reason, and I know this from my wife, the main reason they decided to move to Australia 40 years ago was not because they thought they had cool accents or they wanted to see crocodiles or they wanted to evangelize a whole continent. And so they got this dream and this vision to go evangelize Australia. And what, and what I love about the story is, is they're still going after it. You know, God's been doing great things there. You know, through, through their faith, 40 years later, they're still going. And so I bring that up to say, you know, there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be highs and lows. It's going to be a struggle that we've got to persist in, right, uh, to really live by faith. But, but it's going to be worth it. If it's really faith in God, it's going to be worth whatever struggle we may have to go through. And that's really what Hebrews is all about. Because the Hebrew writer, one of the big themes in the whole book of Hebrews is perseverance, because some of us are going to be like, yeah, I got my faith in And then our kids are going to be like, I'm so discouraged, I can't do it. You know? But we're going to have to persevere. We're going to have to persevere to live by faith. In chapter 10, uh, verses 36 to 39, this, this door to faith, it starts to turn on its hinge. In chapter 10, verses 36 to 39, and the, and the writer there says, you need to persevere. It says, hold on to your faith that will be rewarded. Don't lose your confidence, right? Um, And then chapter 11, the door opens wider, the light of faith starts to shine brighter, and we get the the Faith Hall of Fame, which we're going to be studying together. But then chapter 12, chapter 12, it's not done. The the chapter breaks were put in by people later on. Chapter 12 says in verse 1, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, referring to chapter 11, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How do we do that? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of of faith. In other words, the door was open, and then Jesus came in, and bam, he kicked it wide open. He kicked it wide open. He's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. How did he do that? It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And And I love how this passage ties together joy and faith. I never really thought about that. You know, is your Christianity enjoyable if you're a Christian today? If it's not, if it's some drudgery or some monotony, I would question where your faith is. Because it says here that Jesus, he endured death on a cross for the joy set before him. And so our our faith and and our enjoyment of Christianity, they're they're, they're very well connected. Our faith can make all the difference in enjoying our Christian life. Uh, My father-in-law gave me a great illustration a while back when he preached on the blind men, and I'm just going to steal it from him. He grew, my father-in-law grew up in Louisiana. My group in Louisiana, he's a Cajun. And we had some good Cajun food the other night. That was nice. And, uh, and he'd never seen frozen water before because it doesn't freeze down in Louisiana. And so he, he was doing some work in Missouri uh, 
uh, with a church, and he, 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 for the first time, came up to a frozen lake. And he was kind of like, oh, man, I can walk on water for the first time, you know, because it's frozen. And, but he's very apprehensive because he never walked on ice before. And so he went out there, and he's just kind of, you know, moving along, kind of, you know, scared, you know, envisioning himself, you know, falling through the ice and dying, as we all do when we step on ice, usually, if we're not sure how thick it is. But then all of a sudden, these little kids came out in ice skates, and they just flew right out on the ice, and they were running around skating, and having, having a good old time. And, and, and so the ice hadn't changed. Their faith and his faith were just totally different. And I think that's a great analogy to me of, of, of the Christian who's enjoying their, their faith, and the Christian who's just kind of coming along, just kind of, you know, the Christian without faith is just kind of like, okay, I'll, I'll keep going, God, but I'm not really sure what's ahead. And you're even at some point on your hands and knees, you're so afraid because because you're lacking faith. But the Christian who really has faith and lives by faith, they're able to get out there on their skates and do some pirouettes, you know, and they're just able to, they're just able to enjoy it. And it doesn't matter what may come, they're not worried about it because they know Jesus is the ice. Jesus is the ice in this analogy, and the ice is thick enough. Hebrews 12 says he's already provided. He's already perfected and pioneered our faith. We don't, we don't need to, to, to do more. We don't need to accomplish more. He's already given it to us through his work on the cross. So let's stop crying on our hands and knees, walking scared and unsure. Let, let's leave that behind in our faith. Let's leave that behind and let's joyfully proceed by faith. How do we do that? Fixing our eyes in Hebrews 12 verse 2 on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. If you're new to us today, thanks for coming to, to visit with us. We hope you'll keep coming back. If you're new to us today, I want to ask you, where is your faith? Because there's two kinds of faith in the Bible. There's, there's saving faith and there's sanctifying faith. We've talked a lot today about sanctifying faith, the kind of faith that helps you once you are a Christian. But to become a Christian, you, you need to find saving faith, which involves repentance and which involves baptism and which, and which involves belief. And, and if you're not sure if you have that saving faith yet, please let us introduce you to Jesus. Please study the Bible with us, and we can help you how to find saving faith in him. In church, as we take communion, to close out our time, may we remember Jesus and the incredible power and joy he unleashed in his death and resurrection. And may we learn together more and more in the months to come as we study Hebrews 11 to walk by faith together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we uh, pass the bread, which represents the body of your son and the cup, which represents his blood, uh, we, are, we are so encouraged, God. Thank you for the, the incredible cloud of witnesses we just read about in Hebrews chapter 11 that we're going to get to learn more and more about in the months to come. Thank you for their example, and help us be inspired by their example, God, as it says, to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And I can't think of a better way to do that to start our week than to, to take communion and remember that that blood, it cleanses us, and that body, it inspires us. And let it allow us to persevere, God, as we try to grow by faith. Help us remember that Jesus, he's kicked the, the, the door wide open when it comes to our faith. But help us, God, to stay focused on him through the highs and the lows, through the doubts. We all doubt at times in our faith. And we pray, God, uh, that we can have a great start to our campaign here in the study of faith, God, uh, and that we can remember that through Jesus it's possible. And because of his forgiveness and grace, our doubt can be covered over. And our doubt can even be turned into incredible victory and incredible faith. God, help us to go out this week, this week God, and, and, and in faith, Shun, uh, to really go out there, God, and, and allow our beliefs and our reality to come together, God. And we look forward to celebrating the victories and just claiming the spoils, God, through your son and what he's already done for us on the cross. Uh, we thank you for this time to reflect on that and take communion together as a church body. And please help us, God. Help us. Be with us to grow together by faith. And we praise in Jesus' name. Amen.